Welcome to the Catholic Dadcast by Rich Puntang, where we break down all things dad from a Catholic perspective. Now more than ever, we need dads to step up their game. Gentlemen, buckle up and get ready for battle. Brothers and sisters, welcome to the Catholic Dadcast. I am Rich Pinting, your host and founder, and this is broadcasting from sunny Orange County, California, and today's episode is regarding the newness of a newborn. Everything perinatal, all the confusion you might be going through, all the Folks that might be looking at starting a family, which I know many, and those that are navigating the the uncertainty of what's next and hearing people say it gets better. We're going to talk about the um, how it is that you go from the beauty of of the newborn and understanding how to navigate through that and keep a smile on your face and keep your spouse happy. My, my next guest is a licensed professional counselor from the state of Ohio, operating at a private practice in Cleveland, serving clients through mental health, and most importantly, faith. She's also known as the Catholic therapist. Welcome to the show, Mrs. Lisa Gormley. Thank you so much for having me, Rich. I'm so excited to be here. Yes, and I, and uh, I did chase you down, and um, I want to say that you were extremely smart to to uh, take that um, the Catholic dot org um, <laughs> site, and it's beautifully put together. the The blogs are cool. Uh, I think um, everything you put up on Instagram is awesome as well, and I think that um, those kinds of resources are freely available, and and um, I want to make sure that we we talk about those things here, you know, right out of the gates, because obviously, um, with so much being online, we're getting our share of people that are kind of searching for answers, and that's kind of what this this episode's about. I mean, for for you, Lisa, um, number one, congratulations on baby number two. Thank you. I'm sure that's uh, I'm sure that's uh, that's a uh, you know you know, throwing things around uh, in in the house, um, as far as uh, trying to plan is not uh, always the easiest, you know, having one is one thing, having two is another. But I remember the days and, and you still agreed to come and share. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hoping to come at it with both perspective, right? Like the clinical and the I am right in the middle of it right now. Yeah. Uh, And I I thought, like I said, when I when we first kind of connected, I said, it totally makes sense. And, and uh, I, like the more I look around, Lisa, I'm I'm actually seeing a lot of young couples say we're starting to um, plan what we're doing for our family, starting a family, and so I was I always want to say to them, oh, I can't wait for you to hear this episode that that I'm about to record, <laughs> and then I see those that are going through that phase of. I don't know what I'm doing. This is all new to me. And, and you're trying to figure out all these different aspects of how to keep the peace. So it's, it's, it's so crucial, but you're, I mean, being a licensed professional counselor, I mean, there's gotta be so many different aspects of it that are satisfying. And then on top of that, your passion must've come from somewhere. Yeah. So you probably know because my brother had introduced us, but Um, I'm the youngest of nine. And so I've been around babies all my life. I became an aunt when I was six years old, I think. So, um, and many people that are cradle Catholics probably share this experience that, you know, they're growing up in a big family with big families, seeing big families, and they might, you know, kind of visualize themselves as a mother or father from a very young age and be really excited about it. And it is something to be excited about. Um, And it's, you know, a whole different story, good and difficult. Um, you know, once you actually enter into that one union and two procreation, 
um, and all that entails. And, you know, I've learned about it through the clinical perspective that we'll get into. And then also personally, it's just a whole different story. And, um, you know, like I said, I'll get into it more, but every client that I worked with before I had children or every couple that I worked with before that I was married, I always kind of gave that caveat, you know, like here's, I'm giving you the perspective that's very education-based, um, that's good and solid, but I always recognize like, I don't understand what it's like to be going through exactly what you're going through. It's really different. You know, it's one thing to be, you know, talking about things in theory in this safe room, but I understand it's totally different once you go home. And now I'm able to understand that a little bit that I might, you know, give practical advice or feedback to people or couples. Um, and then, you know, understand that when you go home, I understand it's going to be you know, significantly different to actually implement that, right? It's two different environments. Yeah, in, indeed. And in, in fact, you know, when, when a lot of our listeners get a, get a chance to go to your site, thecatholictherapist.org, they can find you on Instagram as well. And I'll make sure that all that, all that is in the show notes, but it, it really is a blessing to know that, you know, you, you're seeing where you are today coming from a large family. And actually when Jerry said, nine uh family of nine i uh i had to check my audio and uh it, so it is true it really is true yes and uh god you know i would say god bless your parents for um being bold enough to uh follow uh, about how important it is to procreate and and to preach the gospel and and uh you know have children it's there's a, there's a beauty to it mm-hmm. however lisa there's there's a lot of dads that uh, might feel like this is a lot of hard work. And what what it makes me think of is it makes me think of, um, it always makes me think of the Holy Family and the sacrifices, the bravery, um, what they did to support each other, um, the importance of knowing that you've been entrusted with these, these um, you know, the, the gift of life and um, these precious lives. And at the same time, We're not saying it's going to be easy, but we have to learn to embrace every aspect of it, the good and the bad. And I want to say with my daughter being 15 and my son being 10, we've always been told when they were young, don't worry, it gets better. And I distinctly remember that. And um, as many people have said, you know, when they get older, you're going to wish you remembered how small they were. And I'm, I'm sure you get it all the time with the family, mm-hmm. but, but at the same time, it, it's tough. I mean, I mean, if, even if you took a, a step um, back and said, okay, I remember what they told me before I had my first baby. And then um, here's my second. And then all of a sudden it's, I thought it would be easier the second time around. I mean, I mean maybe you can talk about the, the emotions um, and the challenges that kind of came about you know, specifically about the perinatal environment. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I first want to kind of define for, you know, people that may not know what the term perinatal means that refers to the period of time from the moment of conception um, through the child's first year. Um, And that includes, you know, loss um, throughout pregnancy as well. Um, and all the challenges that are between that roughly, you know, two year time period. So you kind of hear things thrown around like postpartum mood disorders, postpartum anxiety, depression, um, perinatal mood disorders. Uh, But essentially all of these diagnoses and symptoms can happen at any point in parenthood. And I say parenthood and not just motherhood, because we'll talk a little bit about Um, you know, how this impacts fathers directly, most of which who are the ones listening, um, and how they can actually be diagnosed with those things as well. Um, And so I kind of, I want to start by, if it's okay, just kind of introducing what these diagnoses are, and then we can maybe go into how that presents itself in like day-to-day life and those like challenges, like you said, when you're seeing it, um, and, and how to really recognize it. So I find that there's two major misconceptions that happen within this realm of, you know, um, diagnoses, symptoms, um, and the, and the perinatal period. And that's first that people often think of, um, postpartum. In fact, I always hear people call it just postpartum, 
Like, oh, I've never had postpartum. Well, you've been postpartum. You may not have had postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety, um, but you know, you're, you're postpartum. So unfortunately that alone kind of tells you that we just tag on like postpartum just means like that, that you've had those um, symptoms and that's not true. Uh, we also kind of think of it as um, just like the suicidal or homicidal cases that you might see in the news or movies. And while those do exist, they're far more rare and they often add stigma to the diagnosis because people imagine that, you know, having any kind of mental health issue postpartum or in that parenthood phase must mean that maybe like I'm going crazy or they, they label it in that way. Um, and the diagnosis um, really for anything going on postpartum is supposed to be liberating, right? So it's supposed to liberate men, women, families from feeling like they're just not good enough or that they're just doing something wrong as opposed to finding out, oh, like this isn't normal, right? Like this isn't supposed to be the, the way I feel. The second misconception and that it is that it's normal to feel um, like hyper emotional or anxious or sad because people give us the famous, well, you just had a baby, you know, go easy on yourself. Um, and we've all heard, you know, those kind of kind sentiments um, and people mean well, but it can really invalidate a woman because you begin to have like this inner dialogue of, I just need to buck up. Everyone must feel this way. And it's so important to distinguish between the baby blues, which I will describe and depression or anxiety. And the baby blues are really like, you'll you hear about that in the hospital and they send you home, that it's really normal in the first two weeks following having a baby that all of your hormones are just doing a dance up and down. Um, and you know, you're nursing, um, or, or you're not nursing and you're adjusting to the emotion of, you know, bottle feeding or whatever that journey looks like for parents. Um, there's a lot of emotions. It's very normal, um, physiologically to let's say have really, you know, frequent tearful moments, um, and just complete overwhelm and exhaustion. Right. But that's just for two weeks and that two weeks flies by, I'm sure, you know, um, and so anything beyond two weeks, if you find yourself frequently um, crying over things that you normally wouldn't cry about, um, or you find yourself, your mood is just not what it was, it's starting to dip. And this is for the mother or the father. Um, if you find yourself, you know, incredibly irritable or, you know, difficulty finding joy in things that you normally find joy in, trouble connecting with your baby. Um, that doesn't mean that you are at risk of harm for your baby. It doesn't mean that you have to be having suicidal thoughts, although that might come with it, but all those emotions that I first, or all those symptoms, I'm sorry, that I described um, prior, those all meet criteria, or you could meet criteria for um, a depression or anxiety or even OCD if you're having intense anxiety about the safety of your baby and, um, and all that kind of thing. So there's a lot more that goes into it diagnosis wise, which is why it's so important to speak to a professional, to call your provider, because all we really see is the six, the famous six week appointment, right? That's when you go to the doctor and they kind of check you and they ask you, and sometimes they, you know, throw a assessment at you and you kind of fill it out and you're in this doctor's office and it can be uncomfortable to like actually, you know, tell them how you're feeling. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I was going to say, Lisa, on, on top of that, was in so many cases, you're right, because everyone's saying, give yourself some grace and it's normal. And there's all, there's so many different opinions coming into you all, like you said, all, all meaning well, but at the same time, uh, human nature is I'll figure it out. I'll get through it. Or, or mm -hmm. it becomes very overwhelming. And, and I'm so bad at this. And I, I keep having to bug people and ask them for additional advice on how to do this. And then they very rarely are looking at themselves and saying, where am I emotionally, physically, mentally? And that's, that's where, you know, someone like yourself comes into play. Sure. And, and my hope is that we can say that um, two things can happen, be true at the same time, be easy on yourself and give you grace. And you don't have to accept this as your new normal. So we can validate that, you know, and normalize, like other people feel this way. You're not going crazy. You're not the only one. And you also don't have to keep feeling this way. This doesn't have to be normal just because it's common doesn't mean it's normal. Um, and if you're listening to this and you may not have had a newborn, I hope you're not tuning it out because 
you know, I know that I said that it goes through the child's first year, but realistically it can go beyond that, especially when you have something that goes untreated. And so you could have a two-year-old, a three-year-old and still be feeling this way or feel like I, maybe I'm just plain old depressed, but it actually might be more like postpartum depression because we have all of these, you know, symptoms that have gone untreated and probably compounded by other things in life that happen and other parts of, you know, the child's life that goes on. And then on top of that, Lisa, you know, it's a lot of times, well, I'm thinking from, from a father's point of view, it almost becomes like we, we're going to, we're going to try to help and do where we can. Um, but because so much of the responsibility feels like it's, it's on the mother that we're, we're somewhat on the sidelines when in reality, I know that that's, that's a common feeling, but there are, there are actually reasons why we, I guess we would feel that way. And I'm, I'm just hoping that there's going to be a dad that's going to say, man, that's exactly how I feel, you know, mm. kind of touch on, on, um, you know, how and why spouses might feel a certain way, you know, throughout having a newborn. Yes, absolutely. And how I'll do that is to first kind of describe what um, these disorders might look like in women so that you can maybe better um, recognize and then advocate for your wife. The best phone call I ever received as a therapist um, when it came to a new referral was by a husband. And I thought that that was so beautiful because he recognized that his wife needed help and he wasn't doing it against her will, but um, she was at a point where she couldn't even really pick up the phone and advocate for herself. Wow, and so he God. did that for her. Absolutely. So um, my, my, what I'd like to do is kind of describe what does this look like in women most often? And this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but just maybe you might hear some things here and there, like, you know what, that sounds like my wife. Um, and then I'll kind of describe what this actually might look like presenting in yourself as the father. Um, and so first off, you know, these, these disorders can also occur in pregnancy, like I said, perinatal. So you can have depression or anxiety pregnant as well. And it's not just hormonal physiological changes. There could be, you know, just a lot of stress on, okay, what are we going to do with my job or maternity leave? Or, you know, am I going to be a good mom? Do I even know um, how to be a good mom? And all the different overwhelming things that are happening between these big fun events like gender reveals and showers, all beautiful things, all exciting things, but there's so much that goes on for both parents throughout that phase. And oftentimes I see that, that moms and dads aren't talking to each other about it, right? Like they're both worried about the finances, but they don't want to burden the other person. They're both worried about not being good enough and they don't want to burden the other person. They're worried about having to be the rock for the other person. And so they don't burden one another, right? Especially men, they want to be that strong rock that doesn't, you know, feel nervous or anxious because- Guilty. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure it's, it's just so common. Um, and I know that you and I talked about like in our previous meeting, like what does that look like for women? Like how to recognize it? Because oftentimes the symptoms of these um, diagnoses seem like just kind of like personality issues, right? So one example is they may not just walk around, you know, crying all the time and, you know, just really sad all the time. They actually could be really irritable and really aggressive, right? Like they could be snapping at you all the time. And that's norm not normally, um, you know, how they act towards you. And we could say, well, yeah, they're not eating as good though. And they're not sleeping. Well, sure. But that's still not normal. So too many times we say that, you know, we, we invalidate everything by saying that you're just not sleeping. You have a newborn, of course, but no, that's not supposed to be the way it is. Um, and so, you know, if you feel like, um, you know, she's, uh, like I said, increasingly irritable or maybe hyper aggressive or just um, maybe isolating herself a little bit more, really needing like more me time. It's, it's not that any me time is means that there's something wrong, but um, really feeling like she needs to be alone frequently. And, you know, instead of your usual, both sitting on the couch at the end of the night, you know, watching TV or, or a certain show, she wants to be by herself pretty frequently. And this can also go for men as well. Um, if you, if you're coming home and, you know, she's, she's feeling overtouched, right? So especially if you've got more than one child, so I've got a newborn and I also have a toddler and both just always need me. And they usually need to be in my arms in some capacity or hanging on me. And so sometimes by the time my husband gets home, um, you know, he might put his arm around me and I will flinch. 
Um, and that could and has initially caused, you know, some arguments or hurt feelings over that until we really got down to, um, and I really didn't even realize until my own clinical training, like, wow, that's what was happening to me that I've just been touched by so many humans today. I know it's just a, a, you know, a hand on the shoulder, but I just, it just sent me, right. It just made me really upset. Um, or I'm very, uh, maybe you might be um, sensitive to not just touch, but st other stimulation, right? So noises. So something falls, a cup falls, and you just might absolutely lose it. And again, this is for the mother or the father. Like you've been hearing noises maybe all day um, and you just want peace and quiet. There's yelling, there's fighting, there's toys being thrown and, you know, just different things going on all day that, you know, your husband might just use a really loud voice and call to you from another room. And that could really irritate you and aggravate you because you just, your ears have been consuming so much all day. Um, and, you know, you just are overstimulated. And these are, these are similar um, presentations between men and women. Um, and that are usually more like, well, you're just grouchy. That's how they're perceived, right? And so that's why they're underdiagnosed, they're undernoticed. And that's what causes aggravation and fighting because then each member of the couple becomes um, very um, defensive, right? Like what is going on? Like, why are you so uh, mean to me? Um, as opposed to recognizing like an unfulfilled need in the other person. Um, you and I had mentioned before we talked about how dads can often feel sidelined, right? Because if a mother is feeling very right anxious, um, they're going to be very controlling over um, who has access to their child. Now, everyone is hyper kind of um, aware of, of germs and safety with a new baby, absolutely. Um, but I can tell you with my own experience with my first, I was very, I've already let somebody, you know, babysit my, my newborn. And it took me about six to eight months and some people even longer to even let my husband just go for a drive with my son. And while it's common to happen with your first, it also doesn't have to be normal because I was experiencing such distress um, when my son wasn't with me because I felt in my anxiety that no one else besides me was thinking about and concerned about the same things that I was concerned about. Therefore, they couldn't keep him safe, right? And so dads can take this as opposed to seeing that as anxiety um, and not targeted towards a specific person, but rather a desire of control, then dads are going to feel like I can't be a good enough dad, right? You're holding him wrong. Watch his neck. You know, are you, are you watching your head? Your, your, this diaper's all wrong. That's why they had a blowout. So mom's anxiety or mom's depressive symptoms of anger, irritability, control are now being targeted towards dad. And dad is feeling like, what, how do I help? I can't do anything right. I can't nurse them. I can't heat a bottle correctly. Apparently, you know, I'm, I'm putting on everything wrong. And that mother is struggling to let dad be a dad. And there's two things going on. We have to help mom advocate for herself and help dad recognize that mom is experiencing distress and it's not targeted towards dad. We also have to give mom that support and encouragement um, and recognition that you need help. This can be different. You can feel better. And otherwise it's going to have an impact on your relationship, right? Because that's just, it's not fair to dad. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, for men and women, it really affects, um, it's important to know that it affects everybody. And I notice that um, people might feel like and tell themselves, well, my life is so good. Maybe we're financially stable. I have a good job. She's got plenty of help. Maybe she has a good job. We have childcare. All those things could happen and it still um, could impact a family. And sometimes that's when it impacts them the most because they're kind of blindsided, right? Like I didn't really prepare for this. Um, but, you know, you can still be anxious about finances and be a millionaire. You know, you can still be, you know, be in perfect health and still be so hyper aware of, um, you know, the safety and well-being and health of you and your family. Um, so I think that's just important to know. I hope that kind of answered, you know, broad questions with how it impacts both and how we really need to pay attention to both for the sake of the other person. I think the moms and dads are, 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 are ready to hear more because even between overstimulation 
um, and then um, all the the various dimensions of how you could be feeling any any given day or week and all the things that contribute to that having an open conversation with someone a professional like yourself it can can be a, a just a, a joy to feel like okay now I get it you know I'm, I can get mm-hmm. I can get by for the next several days knowing that I shouldn't feel like this or um, I should uh, rely on that kind of guidance and coaching from from a professional Sure. And I think that's so important to, even if you feel like, you know, we're doing okay and you may not um, feel any of those symptoms pregnant, um, both of you might have concerns or worries about parenthood that you have never really discussed. And especially if you're coming in from a loss or maybe a history of infertility, you could have these notions in your head, like I should just be grateful um, and I need to be so excited about this. Um, and you know, you you can be nervous and you can be scared and still be so excited and grateful. Those things don't have to be mutually exclusive like we usually treat it. And so I'd encourage, you know, do your baby registry, plan your shower, maybe go see somebody. You know, talk to someone so that you can have an objective third person to kind of um, mitigate a little bit and talk about, okay, what are you like when you are exhausted? Because I promise you that before you had children, unless you've, you know, had experience with caretaking or something like that, you will not experience that type of exhaustion consistently um, until, you know, this child comes into the world. And so what are you like when you're starving? What are you like when you don't get your me time? What are you like when you feel lonely or when you feel like too many people are around you? All of those things that you know are going to probably happen in the postpartum, um, you know, let's say like three to six month period um, so that you can talk about, you know, oh, geez, like I'm a different person or maybe the other, the spouse recognizes like, oh, I know, I know that, you know, she really, when her sugar is low, like I, I can tell like immediately, right. You know, and we laugh about it, but how serious when the actual, um, you know, expression of that happens, how that can really trigger arguments that can be completely unavoided, right? And, you know, the purpose of this podcast is to kind of like awaken those lukewarm Catholics, right? To really make fathers and mothers like these on fire, um, you know, Catholics for their faith and to raise other faithful Catholics. And we need to be aware that because of the importance of the family and because of importance of children, and how weak it makes the devil, he is going to attack the family. He is going to attack, um, you know, all the thoughts that are going on in your head. And that doesn't mean that you don't need therapy. You don't have depression. You just need to pray more, or you just need to go see a spiritual director. You can do both those things, but you also, um, Satan attacks mental illness. He can't attack, um, you know, what's not there. And so he doesn't create something or put something there. He doesn't have that kind of control, but what he can do is exacerbate things that are there, like, you know, that pre-existing depression or anxiety. Um, And so just that overall awareness and being prepared, like you can go see somebody and that doesn't mean that you're sick. It doesn't mean that you're ill. Um, You know, we don't have to wait until we have a fire in the house to get a ladder to get out the window. We want to do things preemptively, even if they never happen, um, you know, to kind of prepare. And we need to do that for our mental health and we need to do that for our souls, for ourselves, for our children, benefits everybody. Such a great point, Lisa, because because the the, the family is, is, is such the foundation, you know, and I know that the, there's a reason why he's called the father of lies because he likes to create that kind of chaos. He likes to put that doubt and uh, wreak havoc specifically in the family. And that's, that's really what you, you know, you see in, in society is uh, a direct, not even, not even uh, a quiet attack, just very blatant. And so that's why these conversations are such a big deal because families are going to go through that. You know, it's, it, it's, especially when you, you have uh, a, a dynamic environment with a newborn and, and all that's required, um, it, it, may, it does feel overwhelming. And, and, and uh, I mean, us, us as, as, uh, as husbands, you know, sometimes we're just going to feel like, 
I just got to be ready and, and know where I can help when I can. But yeah, I, I would think there's just times that we, we just feel like we're, we aren't fully um, aware of how exactly we can help, where we should focus our attention. And, and f- for dads, I think sometimes we just, we, we just want to have a pity party for ourselves because it's all about mom. It's all about, you know, baby, the baby and, and the kids and all that. That's where all the attention is. They're coming to visit them and check on them. And I'm, I'm, you know, we're just kind of here on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole point is when you think of even the Holy family, all the attention was on Mary and and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so there's St. Joseph's just doing what he's supposed to do, being Mm -hmm. obedient, serving, serving the queen, serving the king. And, and then, but the, the whole point is you still have to stop and, and recognize to yourself, how, how do I feel? How, how does my physical state mm-hmm. affect maybe my, my emotions and, and having a, a chance to connect with, uh, with your husband or your wife and just saying, this is how I feel. This is what's mm-hmm. going on, you know, very open conversation. And sometimes that happens in, in, in an open prayer together, which when you, 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 can, you can imagine how beneficial that might be. Sure, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it's important that while, yes, that is the role, and, and this is kind of a good segue into like the, the impacts of the church on, on these kind of um, thoughts and belief systems. Um, but if we want to honor the, the father's role and empower dads, we have to, um, we have to give them that honor too. And so while you're so right that, you know, that's kind of is like, you know, St. Joseph's model to us is that, you know, you're there to like work and provide and, you know, be a support. Um, I can't tell you, there was, there was a day not long ago where, um, especially like for any nursing moms, they know that like, you have to get your set up, right? So right before you're about to nurse, especially if you know the baby's going to fall asleep on you, you got to get the remote, you got to get your water, you got to get everything you know, a diaper, everything in like reaching position, because once you're there, it's really hard to like get up and you're, you know, you don't have as much mobility. And so I, I probably charged off maybe four in a row. Can you get me this? Can you get me this? Can you get me that? And my husband's so great about that. And he's kind of like my legs in the house sometimes when I can't get from one place to another. Um, and I just recognize, I do it all the time without noticing, but in that moment, I happen to recognize, I swear God just called awareness to it that you know, he just was, yes, like keeping his kind of head down and just doing those things. And I know that he has this belief, like, well, you brought this trial to the world. You went through the whole pregnancy. Like, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm not going to complain if if this is all I have to do. And he said that before, if, if all I have to do is go grab you water and do all this, I'm going to do it quietly and and respectfully. Um, But I just, I stopped and I said, thank you so much for doing all of this, you know, little work that you do. Like he has such a big role in our family, but all these small things too, you know, really add up. And I just feel so supported. Um, And I want to make sure I don't always do a good job at that, but you know, we as mothers need to make sure that we're pausing for a second and checking in on our dads, because if we want them to be our heads of household, if we want them to be strong, our words carry so much and they need our love and they need our affection. And I think that that promotes this, um, you know, this really strong leadership role we have to let them lead the family um, and, and give them encouragement along the way. And I think there's nothing wrong. In fact, it's vital to really encourage and love our dad so that, you know, like the work that I'm putting in big or small is being recognized and it motivates and empowers, you know, you more to continue to do that and continue to be that support for your wife. Shout out to daddy Gormley. (laughs) <laughs> he's, virtual, he's gonna laugh hearing hug. this he was cracking up saying oh i can't wait to hear this all, all the advice that you're gonna give like calling me out on my bluff because of you know my my imperfections too which i said in the beginning of this you know i will give my you know overarching um perspective of it but that's when i'm sitting i have no kids with me right now this is a controlled environment and I recognize that, you know, practicing is a lot more difficult, but I have to give a shout out to him too, because he is very patient with me and just dads are generally by nature, so much, so patient during this process and just such good support systems. Um, and if you're feeling like that's missing, that either you're a dad where you feel like you aren't getting that validation and, and love, like, you know, I really encourage you to, to speak up and, and tell your wife that and say like, you know, 
I know that you know this um, and I know that you love me, but I'd love it if you verbalized it sometimes. Or I'd love, you know, if at the end of the day, we just talked about it, or maybe, you know, we sat close together on the couch or, you know, whatever that looks like, um, because we want to know how to help you. Sometimes you guys are so dang quiet and just kind of go with the flow. Um, we need to know that like, you're, you're feeling a little bit lonely sometimes, or you're feeling a little bit neglected, right? Yeah. And that's, and that's very open to say that because a lot of times you're right. Uh, we, we're going to internalize stuff and it's, you know, whether we're, st we're stonewalling and holding things in and we don't know exactly how to be very open about how we're feeling, but you're right. And, and, you know, I mean, hats off to you, Lisa, because as, as small as those things might be, those are actually big things. Sometimes mm -hmm. small things are big things. And, and, um, and, and he does it cause he loves you and he knows that you're doing such uh, great work and being so attentive, being a loving mom, uh, caring, nurturing, and if if our role is is as such, then then so be it. You know, so long as uh, I'm serving my family, my wife, and my child, that's that's probably the way he sees it. And but you're right. Um, sometimes it's a uh, as guys. Sometimes you want to slap on the tush, like, hey, thanks for sticking by me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I I. I think it also helps women realize that those little things, the getting the water, if you're not paying attention to it, you're missing these acts of service and these acts of love. Um, and it's so easy to be like, well, if, you know, especially like right after you have that baby, I'm kind of like, I did not feel bad about asking for one thing. Right. And sometimes that carries on a little bit and I can take him for granted and, you know, we can, we can get a little bit bossy. That may not be everyone. Maybe that's me personally. Um, but I've seen it in other women before. Like, you know, we, are maybe just a little bit spent, especially if you had a difficult pregnancy, if especially if you had a difficult or even traumatic birth. Um, you know, it can feel really easy to look past those things that have to be done for you. Like sometimes, you know, women are going to need help going to the bathroom. Like they need help eating. They need help doing things coming off after their birth. If it what, especially if it didn't go as they expected, and that's when dads are are stepping in. And if we t for too long don't recognize those as acts of service that's when we start to feel like we aren't getting them those acts of service at all. So, you know, an example might be, um, I had worked with a woman who, you know, felt like her husband didn't do anything romantic, like bring flowers or, you know, do anything like that since they had their baby and their baby was only about maybe eight months old. And we really talked about, you know, that this went, she felt like he didn't give acts of service to her um, because he wasn't doing things that were outside of like their domestic life. Um, but once we really went through their daily life, she was able to list like dozens of daily acts of service by him, um, that really one helped her feel loved and validated. Like, oh, he was doing it this whole time. I just wasn't noticing. And it also was an opportunity for her to then show gratitude to him because, you know, he was doing all of these things, maybe unnoticed. Um, and it also, it ended up where she said, you know, I'm actually going to ask for half as much, or I'm going to try and take over some of those things. Um, and I would rather him take 15 minutes longer on the way home to pick me up flowers than I would him to come home, you know, at that time and take care of some of the kids. So you kind of can choose. And some women might say, keep the flowers, get home as soon as you can, because I would rather the extra set of hands. And that communication is exactly what helps encourage, you know, those things changing so that the other person's needs are being fulfilled um, and that you're able to fulfill their person's needs. That's great identification because I've I've had conversations with young couples that don't yeah like like you said we don't always recognize that gosh he he is doing a lot or she is doing a lot for me and and uh, when I when I actually stop to think about it and have this conversation regularly he might be doing something or she might be doing something and the funny story about the flowers is uh, a couple of weeks ago was my wife's birthday and she, she's actually not, not really big on flowers, but you know, I felt it was appropriate and it, it I felt like it, it would lighten up the environment and we could see it all week and all that good stuff. And for whatever reason, for the next like three, three weeks, I, we were all having like terrible allergies and we're like, it has to be the flowers. It has to be. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I think we think that we kind of eliminated it and we, we think it may be. But 
Oh no. The gesture was well received <laughs> and uh, you know, we, we celebrated, but, but you're right. Something as simple as that is um, allows us to, to, to feel like, you know, open communication and how do we stay connected? Because the attention is, is typically not on each other in yes. Yes. You're serving each other, but not necessarily um, in a way that maybe best serves me or best serves my wife at that time. It, it really becomes, Oh, how do you, remain open in communication and say, what do you need right now? And one of the things that we say in our dad's group that I'm a part of, shout out to the dad edge uh, mastermind. We talk about um, when you know that like there's tension and you don't know exactly what it is. It's just important sometimes to just say, how can I best serve you right now? And then you just shut mm -hmm. up and we, we just, we just say, don't let them speak, mm -hmm. let them speak and express themselves. And some, sometimes it's just, I just want to take a bath and have a glass of wine. You got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes. Okay. You're like, no, I need to have an hour. Okay. Good. <laughs> but the whole point right. is it's, it's open communication. And sometimes having a newborn in the house, mm -hmm. everything is, is solely focused on the needs of the child, you know, rightfully so. Sure. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, if, if anyone's listening to this and feels like, I mean, that sounds great, but I don't even feel like we can do that. Right. And I I've been there where a 15 minute bath doesn't even sound realistic. Sometimes that's, I think it's so good and so needed. And I encourage you to make that time. But on those nights where the day is getting ahead of you, you don't have to just like chalk it up as a loss. Like you can still, um, not add anything in your day, but instead add and, in, um, increase intentionality. So, you know, we hear if, it, if it's not with love, you know, it's a sounding gong and, and we could be doing the same acts and behaviors. And if we're doing them begrudgingly, it's just a waste and it's going unnoticed. But if we do those same acts with love, it not only fulfills the server, but it fulfills the person who's being served. Um, and so ask yourself throughout your day, you know, when it's just your day is really just work and cleaning and changing diapers, all of those things that you're doing without adding anything else, are you doing them with love? If you don't have time or the money for extra added things like a date night or a babysitter or a movie or whatever it is, are you doing the small, simple things with love? Are you stopping to stare at the person in their eyes that you have no idea? I mean, I'm sure you, you do have an idea, but people really underestimate the lack of eye contact they might make in a day because especially with multiple children and, and your tag teaming, you're really just, you know, you're, you're in each other's presence, but you're not looking at each other. You're feeding, you're cutting up food, you're changing diapers, you're doing baths, and then you might sit in bed and watch TV together and you're still looking forward. You know, look at each other's eyes. Um, and you had asked me to, and I don't have to go into that right this second, but, you know, some practical things um, that- I'd love I love it. I That's love perfect it. I'm, segue. I'm, I'm actually thinking that that uh, a lot of the a lot of the dads would think, "Gosh, but where do I go from here? What what are some mm -hmm. real realistic practical actions I can take tonight sure. or tomorrow?" Sure. Um, so the one thing I would recommend is doing a devotional, and I want to give a clarification on the devotional together because a devotional can seem sometimes. Um, it depends on the devotional you do. I highly recommend a Catholic devotional. Sometimes you might find like one um, that is just not as um, fruitful. And so I encourage you, if you find one that you feel like is not very fruitful or powerful for you, just find another one, like keep working. Some people aren't a fan of devotionals. I love them because they're short and realistic um, and it always encourages dialogue. But I, we, we'd always do a devotional at the end of every night, something short. And if we feel compelled, we'll do a second page to it. We never follow like the days. Um, that's just not realistic to us. And it just kind of, it hurts our encouragement. It's also something you can do where if you, if you're finding yourself like too tired at night and you're just not finding that moment together to really have your brain on that you can do it separately. And that, you know, that you're meditating on the same things, you're praying in, for the same things and you're reading the same. And so even though you're doing them separately, um, and even if you don't end up talking about it that day, you know that you've, you've accomplished those two things. Because sometimes when your head hits the pillow or like once the kids are in bed, like you're in bed and that's perfectly understandable. Um, 
And so the second thing would be to have a sort of script that you create. Um, I have my own, you know, my husband, and I have our own script for like the end of night. Um, but the, it's really different for every couple. And it could be something like you identify, we make it really easy, like preschool. One thing that we're grateful for, one thing that we need differently from the other person, and then what our prayer is for the other person. So you are initiating in gratitude. You're expressing what you'd like for the other person for like the next day or ongoing days, but then you're also praying for that person. And there might be days when you passively, aggress passively, <laughs> passive aggressively ask and pray for that the other person gets more patience or something like that. But ideally, you know, you pray for something like, I pray that you love your job tomorrow. Um, I pray that you feel like you um, are more yourself tomorrow. Like you pray and you will the good of the other person for that day. So you kind of have that three components. That doesn't have to be the three that you settle on. Um, it could be even simpler than that, but usually it engages in dialogue. And once you do it, I think the day, the number of days is like 21 days to make a habit or something like that, but it should become your routine, like brushing your teeth. Um, sometimes we're doing it when we're, you know, actually going to bed. And sometimes we're doing it while we're doing the dishes together, whenever we remember it in order to get it done, it's something that's just really realistic and brings us together and doesn't even have to take more than five minutes. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, it's, a uh, to me, those are very intentional. They are, um, spirit filled. They are open communication and, and very thought provoking because sometimes those thoughts are, are left uh, internally and, and not, not really ever shared, you know, because mm -hmm. life is very fast and busy. But, the, but it's so cool to see that, mm -hmm. to be able to pray for each other, to pray with each other. And we talk about it a lot, but when you do it in practice and you, you know that here's a great time to do it when you're multitasking, yeah, there's, there's gonna be times where it may not stick as much, but over time, if you're consistently doing it, it's only keeping Christ in the middle of your, your marriage. Um, and that ultimately helps you serve your family and each other and, and the glorify God in, in, in general. So by far, that's, that's such a, such a beautiful thing. And dads, I, I will just tell you, it requires you to do it and requires you guys to agree that if it is 21 days, you know, enjoy those, those 21 days because, you know, even without the prayer, you're going to, you, you can see how, how much benefit there is and how much you're getting from, you know, simple tactics like that, that, you know, quite frankly, we probably should be doing, but to acknowledge that it would be helpful um, and to, to use those particular, um, th that particular advice it's doable. And it's not like it's, it's not like, wow, 45 minutes. It's, you know, it could be a 10 or 15 minute conversation. And, mm -hmm. but the, probably the best 10 minutes you probably get out of each other because there's so much going on in, in, in any given day, Lisa, any, any other, um, any other words of advice or parting words for uh, the dads, the families, uh, those with a newborn, those that are possibly thinking of starting their families, anything you'd like to share? Yeah, so I have a list of resources that um, they primarily are around um, postpartum support international um, and it's postpartum.net. And then there are several offshoots, specific resources for dads. Um, and the whole site is geared mostly towards mom, but there are, um, so I don't even need to include those because if you go on the site, you'll find them, but I will include, and I will email those to you. So you can maybe put them in the show notes, um, some resources specifically for dads and mental health. Um, and it's just a phenomenal resource that has, um, you know, books and, um, trainings. They also have groups that are free and virtual. Sometimes people feel more comfortable with that because it's from people all over the country and they're anonymous. Um, there's also a private Facebook group for dads um, to kind of can be in community and talk to each other. There's also an Instagram page called Postpartum Stress, um, and it's it's led by the Postpartum Stress Center, and that's just helpful. I think that it's it's important to incorporate practical resources like following people on Instagram or pages on Facebook because if that's where you're spending kind of like your downtime, you notice 
um, incorporate positive things. I hope one of that also would be following me on Instagram, which is where my ministry is mostly. Um, I just kind of, you know, post things about faith and mental health. And I link to my blogs. I haven't been super active since I'm on maternity leave with my blogs, but on Instagram, I still am. Um, and I mentioned, I think in the beginning, like I can see, um, individuals for therapy for, um, if you are living in the state of Ohio. So if you or your wife or as a couple are living in the state of Ohio and you're open to telehealth, I don't know how long telehealth will be accessible, but it's looking like for quite a while with the pandemic, um, then, you know, I can see you even if you're not from Cleveland. And then I also offer coaching services as well, um, for non-mental health related, um, future oriented goals. I primarily work with uh, women. And so if you, you know, or if you want to recommend your wife wants to see me ahead of having a baby, or maybe you're trying to have a baby and you just want those practical skills, um, organizational, um, goal setting, dreaming, managing work and home life, all those kinds of things that are more practical, practical and less past oriented or trauma oriented, um, then I can certainly be of help and they are welcome to email me. I'm sure you'll put my email in the show notes or they could follow me on Instagram. That's correct, Lisa. And, and, and I, I applaud you for, for all your work, very thorough, very knowledgeable. I think that that's what the, the dads and, and uh, the wives probably heard today that there's, there's so many dimensions of having a newborn in the home, but learn to see, you know, God's blessings throughout it all. And, and Lisa's got, she's got a great website, the Catholic therapist.org, where she does have a lot of the resources um, regarding helplines, um, counselors, and, and her blog um, specifically on different aspects uh, that, that might help you. And on, and on Instagram, you'll find that um, a lot of her insight will probably feed your soul on a regular basis as she um, continues to put her content up there. But, but Lisa, thank you for all you do. I think everything that we've we've heard today was was so valuable and we'll make sure that we put it all in the show notes and I will pray for the Gormley home, of course. Thank you so much as well. And you have my prayers um, for you and your beautiful family. And thank you for giving me the opportunity and the platform to speak to your listeners and to connect to other Catholics around the country and world, I'm sure. Nothing but love for Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> Thanks so much, Rich. Family and friends, this podcast episode has ended. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.